Okay. Uh, can you see my screen right now? All right. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Michal and oh, sorry. And I'm a co-founder of Curiosum alongside Shimon. And uh, today I'm going to talk to you about a topic that uh, has programmers divided by uh, mindsets, preferred techniques, and many other factors, uh, namely debugging Elixir applications. Uh, and a brief word about me, and I promise it's a really brief one. Uh, as I said, I'm a co-founder and CTO at Curiosum, a Poland-based, Poznań-based software house. And my professional journey in Elixir is that of an, uh, a learner turned practitioner turned tinkerer, uh, because I've always liked um, learning and uh, getting to know things maybe in a bit uh, weird ways, unorthodox ways. Uh, and uh, this is going to uh, appear and this is going to feature pretty heavily in this presentation. Uh, and most of this presentation is going to be about uh, non-typical ways of doing things with regard to uh, debugging Elixir applications and finding issues in your Elixir code. But uh, OK, let's um, start with uh, a description of um, some attitudes that people have when it comes to uh, analyzing their apps, flaws, and errors. Um, it seems that programmers' attitudes to debugging vary a lot from person to person. And these attitudes uh, have a profound effect on developers' productivity. Um, for example, mm, some people's first choice when it comes to finding out why their code is not working correctly is uh, Stack Overflow. Mm, and while it's good to uh, use as a source to Google ready solutions, you can't really count on having it do all the job for you. Uh, then when you get to be a bit more creative, some people won't bother setting up any real debugging tools. And as a habit they've learned over time, they will just print to the console to test stuff out. Uh, sometimes it's just about moving the print statement up the code, uh, until it's finally executed and, uh, not like, um, hidden somewhere, uh, after a line which causes an error. Uh, so I compare it to dipping a sonar in the sea, in a way. Uh, at the other extreme, uh, there are people like me who would rather hack every little thing in library they touch instead of reading the documentation. And uh, as it turns out that more often than not, code is poorly documented uh, in this world. Uh, it's I would say it's a justified approach. And um, honestly, I love working in environments that make it easier for me to literally pry into every little corner of the code, um, which is one of the reasons I used to love Ruby, uh, among others, because in Ruby, as uh, shown in this example, uh, I was able to modify every single already defined module and do uh, whatever I wanted to analyze how it works. And I would do this routinely, even if it had a good documentation. And with Elixir and uh, it's totally different mechanisms of metaprogramming um, and it's compiled nature as well. Uh, I've had to adapt uh, because Elixir is also very flexible, um, also allows me to do a lot of hacks, but um, it's, uh, yeah, it's mechanisms are very different and I've had to readjust my code hacking techniques. Um, and I guess in some cases, this, uh, might be a counterproductive approach when you're too insistent on reverse engineering things this way, but, uh, from, 
from my perspective, I think I wouldn't ever be in this place uh, if uh, I didn't uh, use these techniques for learning stuff. Uh, and the another one, this is my favorite sort of mindset that I sometimes see in Elixir forums. Uh, people argue that Elixir as a highly concurrent language doesn't need anything else than tracing and IO inspect. It's like, uh, I don't need this, so you don't either. Uh, people assume that Elixir code is solely about pure functions and that this alone should warrant impeccable quality of code. Uh, surely enough to not need anything beyond uh, uh, Erlang Observer and I/O inspecting. Uh, and in threads with questions on a specific debugging tool, uh, these people, instead of answering, will promote the idea that Elixir is a language that, by its nature, needs uh, little else than I/O inspect. Uh, even more interesting is uh, the assumption about naturally very quick code recompile and reload in Phoenix. Uh, and uh, moving the bugging lines around being no trouble. Um, I've seen too many projects that had spaghetti dependencies to believe this. Uh, when you land in a project written in a way that involves compiling a hundred files every time you make a little change uh, due to module dependencies being poorly structured, then you will quickly hate the idea of uh, actually I am inspecting anything. Uh, so some takeaways when it comes to the attitude to the bugging are that most apps are developed in a rushed way and there's no uh, real life example of an app free from technical debt. Uh, so something that can be treated as a good cue is uh, always trying to write your code as something that's only incidentally interpreted by a machine because the real uh, recipient and reader is a future programmer that you'll never meet. Uh, but you can't only rely on everyone else following this principle, so you won't escape having to master uh, the bugging techniques to an extent. Mm. Then relatively few commercial projects are really well documented, and even some well-adapted library creators stop doing any docs apart from the readme. Uh, which taught me to trust actual code uh, that you see way more than any accompanying docs. Uh, and overall, uh, there's no perfect uh, attitude cue to efficient debugging other than being creative and inquisitive in the environment you're working in. Uh, anyway, mm, some people uh, will still insist that Elixir is a language that leads to good design choices, blah, blah, blah. And that's why uh, you don't need to bother debugging like you used to. And with those people, I won't be fighting. So uh, yeah, mm, that's about that. Uh, now moving on to the tools and techniques available for Elixir programmers. Uh, the tool set is different depending on what issues have to be resolved. Uh, different tools are used for uh, analyzing and profiling a running system, which is very useful for getting to the bottom of whatever is going on in production. And a totally different story is digging into code flows uh, while developing the application in your dev environment. Uh, so in Alexi applications, you can use everything Erlang has to offer. Uh, it's built in tools observer, and debugger, uh, as well as external tools for message and function call tracing, uh, which includes uh, Redbug, Early Berly, and probably some others. Uh, so for live system debugging, we have the Erlang Observer, which is a must for large scale production systems, and allows you to peek into your Beam applications, load memory, uh, OTP apps, uh, processes, and so on as well as tracing messages and functions. Um, the latter two can also be traced using more lightweight tools, more suitable for dev tool set usage, such as Redbug uh, and Rexbug uh, for Erlang and Elixir, respectively. Uh, 
or early barely, which is well a bit odd in the fact that it's got a Java-based GUI. And uh, of course, for debugging anything running on Beam, you can use Erlang's debugger to go through your code step by step when you need to see precisely what the current execution context is and find faulty lines of code. And this tool is also OK for Elixir usage with some reservations that I'm going to talk about later. Uh, so moving on to the Elixir world, in addition to all tools that you know from the Erlang world, uh, you can use, uh, obviously, Elixirs and related libraries, uh, proprietary tools. Uh, for example, uh, Phoenix Framework includes the awesome Live Dashboard tool, which has quite some of the features known from Erlang Observer, uh, as well as Phoenix specific features such as telemetry integration or request logging. Uh, so that's pretty important if you actually use Phoenix Framework for your web apps. Uh, there is also IEX's built-in pry and break features for inserting breakpoints in the code and inter interacting with uh, particular execution contexts. Um, so in this presentation, uh, debugging at the code level is the thing I'm mainly going to focus about. Uh, so let's assume that I'm mostly talking about all, let's say, breakpoint driven debugging techniques that allow you to interact with a particular execution context at a specific place in the code. Uh, these are obviously techniques mostly restricted to uh, development and test environments and not very suitable for parallel execution. But contrary to some opinions I've seen, it really isn't a good reason to neglect it and disregard its importance in the languages toolset. Uh, and after all, it's often very practical to analyze the behavior of a single instance of code that's, in, that's intended to be parallelized later on. Uh, in the end, you might uh, have a preference towards debugging using GUI tools or just the REPL. But the truth is that most GUI tools we've got either uh, lack functionalities or are clumsy in usage. So I usually seek for good and comprehensive tools that I just can control using the REPL. Uh, so starting with the uh, IO inspect like tools, um, you know, for those who like debugging by printing stuff into the console or for those situations where it's practical, uh, Elixir has the IO inspect function that can be nicely plugged into a pipe operator expression. Uh, there is also the logger module for more complex logging, which will be inevitable for most large scale apps to some extent. Uh, but the usage of logging and printing diagnostic information relies on you uh, knowing exactly what to look for in a particular code context. And if you're deaf in your dev environment, it's just more often than not more practical to take a break, look at the current binding, inspect it, uh, play around with a function here and there, look up how data structures look like. Remember that you often can't rely on your predecessors and library creators doing a good job with type specs and documentation. Uh, so here comes the Erlang debugger. And uh, yeah, it's built into Erlang and it's great for Erlang, but uh, even if in Erlang you feel right at home using it um, in that context, uh, then when you come to Elixir, it doesn't really directly evaluate Elixir syntax. Uh, and it requires manual starting from console and marking modules for interpretation uh, to make it work. Uh, doesn't provide me with the comfort I was once used to with uh, REPL-based debuggers in uh, languages such as Ruby and so on. Um, so what else can we use? Uh, here comes IDX, which, uh, to be honest, at the beginning was very disappointing to me, uh, because, you know, it's got the pry functionality, which allows you to insert a breakpoint on a specific line of code by, uh, inserting the, uh, IDX that pry macro call, uh, 
but intentionally it's not a fully fledged debugger with which you can step into and out of functions and you cannot even go through lines of code step by step uh inserting line breakpoints with the macro uh obviously requires recompiling which is uh, well elixir is not bad at that but really uh it's only theoretically fast i would say and in quite a lot of applications it's, it's just slow uh, and also there's the break helper which is uh, great because you can go into the REPL and uh, use it to insert breakpoints separately for each RET clause of a function. Uh, you don't have to recompile anything. Uh, and also you can use this helper for uh, debugging code that you can't, you know, the, the code that, that you don't own. So uh, for debugging libraries that you use and stuff like this, it's great. Uh, but the issue is that uh, it only inserts breakpoints at the very beginning of a function, which is uh, good if the function is short enough. But as I said, it's not a perfect world. And you, go, you often end up in situations when uh, it's not practical to use it. Uh, so uh, how to make the most out of IEX and use it like a pro? Uh, for example, when developing Phoenix framework applications, uh, it's good to take into account straight from the beginning when configuring your test env that uh, debugging with um, uh, test env, dev env, and st stuff like that, it's, uh, it's really prone to timeout issues by default. Uh, for example, uh, when prying into a controller action in Phoenix, it's going to, mm, uh, no, it's going to give you a timeout after 60 seconds. So after 60 seconds, the, the process just, uh, closes down. Uh, so for, for instance, the idle timeout, uh, option of cowboy fixes this issue. You can increase it uh locally at least uh there is also the x unit timeout mm, which uh is a limit on how long a particular test case is so uh, it's good to increase it in the test env mm, unless this is running on a ci for example uh as well as the db ownership timeout which is also something that's gonna annoy you in tests a lot uh, so, um, then as we said, uh, IEX is a limited tool by design, but there are some tweaks that you can do on your own to tweak it and add new features to this building on existing ones. Uh, so let's look at, uh, how to use IEX macros to conveniently peek into pipelines uh and their intermediate results and navigate uh through code step by step which is uh, one of the features that i think are sorely lacking from uh ix so uh yeah the first thing is picking into pipelines and uh i told you that we can easily pick into a pipeline uh using io inspect uh, but if we want to use IEX.pry and insert a breakpoint in the middle of, of a pipeline, uh, then uh, we can split the pipeline into two separate ones or do something like this uh, to uh, insert a breakpoint there, uh, which is ju just piping the intermediate result uh, into a anonymous function that we call. Uh, since elixir 1.12 we can replace it with kernel.tap uh, and omit these arg returning here so that's something good to know uh, but how about creating a reasonable piece of code uh, that allows us to just um, do it in a way shorter way uh, we can create a macro 
which is going to be expanded to roughly this. Uh, then backtrace context uh, will remain where macro expansion happened, which uh, is good. And how to explain this? Uh, this is this this is gonna mean that when we call ix.pry, then we're gonna see uh, the source code uh, in the console, and it's not gonna uh, go into this macros implementation, but it's gonna remain here, uh, and which which usually is an annoying thing when it comes to debugging macros and debugging, in fact, anything that uh, was generated by a macro. Uh, but in this case, uh, we use it to kind of our benefit. Uh, and to expose the argument uh, piped into this function uh, to a context outside the macro body, because remember that we are here, uh, we use this uh, var thing to circumvent macro hygiene with, uh, which uh, is a mechanism which would allow disallow us normally from seeing this foreign ball uh, in the current binding. Uh, so as you can see, uh, we have this uh, this function in this, this macro implemented is this module, and when we call this macro, which we named peak here. Uh, we can see that we remain here um, in AEX. And when we mm, refer to this argument that we exposed using var here, uh, then we can look up at how, uh, at what was the mm, intermediate value of, uh, of the pipeline processing here. Uh, so moving on to the next issue with uh, Pry, which is the inability to uh, navigate step by step in the code. Uh, as stated before, we can insert a breakpoint with Pry or break to interact with the context, but we cannot navigate through the code uh, like you do with proper debuggers. And uh, I asked myself if I can overcome this without uh, tampering with how IEX breakpoints work. And here's uh, what I did in just a moment. Uh, so to allow navigation between each consecutive lines of code, you could insert as many price statements as needed. Uh, and I thought, why not use a convenience macro to help me out? Uh, so I started thinking like this, if def itself is a macro in the kernel module, and even def macro is defined using def macro, uh, which by the way is a very interesting mechanism, uh, one can easily imagine a macro that does the same thing, but inserts IEX.pry between each pair of uh, code lines via AST manipulation. So um, I thought that I could create a uh, maybe def debuggable macro for that, uh, corresponding to def normally, but you, you would have to recompile a module for each function that you like to debug if you insert this. So it would be no better than using just IEX.break for most cases. Uh, then I started thinking of how I could create a module that I can use uh, and automatically make all functions debuggable like this. Uh, and the mere idea of having IEX.pry all over the place might seem dumb, but later we'll show how to build on it to create a more practical mechanism. And uh, the question then is, since def is a macro in kernel, can we somehow override it? So a module we create has a different definition of def. Uh, the answer is yes, and quite easily so, uh, because inside the code, we must call the original implementation of def with expert, as we see here, uh, containing the body of function that can now be manipulated uh outside the cold expression we can do whatever we'd like to do uh at the moment the function is defined so uh this is not gonna be uh printed out to the screen 
while executing the uh, the application, but uh, it's going to appear at the very moment the application uh, is uh, th this module is compiled. Uh, so that's just an example, and how can we uh, use it for more practical purposes? Um, well, we can, for example, uh, override def to tamper with every single function that we implement inside the module for whatever purposes, login function calls, other debugging purposes, etc. Uh, for demonstration purposes, I wanted to show that we were able to put an output message at the stage of defining the function. And as you can see, uh, that expert thing uh, contains the function a the functions uh, AST, uh, which can be altered uh, so that, for instance, every function you create in your module contains uh, a logger call at the beginning of uh, its execution. Uh, for easier usage in any of your modules, you could create a using macro that you can, uh, so you can plug it in with the use keyword. Uh, and uh, speaking of the um, overwriting of uh, kernel macros that we used here, uh, a conceptually similar but safer implementation of uh, overwriting those macros has been proposed by QQWI uh, at GitHub at this link, uh, which uses def overridable and involves calling uh, kernel special form super to call the original method. Uh, so um, it's a bit safer and cleaner than what I'm using here. Uh, and if you wanted to uh, explore it uh, more thorough, uh, thoroughly, uh, you can have a look at this, mm. but for the purpose of uh, just playing around, it's perfectly fine not to use it, actually. Uh, so when it comes to creating macros that conceptually just tamper with existing code to insert something here and there, I generally tend to use the aid of quote expressions that allow me to compare an example input with desired output and then just transform ASTs with standard uh, list manipulation techniques. So uh, here's an example of a function that I would like to transform into having IEX.pry uh, between each pair of its lines, as well as keep returning uh, a value in the original way it was created. And the before variant looks like this, with uh, two expressions inside the function body, uh, assigning one to X and multiplying it by three. And here's the AST of uh, this block of a function. And the after looks like this. Uh, so here's an AST of how the function will look after our transformation. Uh, so mm, you can see that we inserted IEX.pry here, here, and here, and uh, also to preserve the uh, original way the function returns the value, we assign uh, this to a result that we then return. So uh, in the ASD, these are the original lines of code from the function's body. Uh, now, these are the IEX.pry calls that I want to insert. And this is the thing I have to do in order to assign the last expression that function to a variable that I can then conveniently return. Uh, so this is a simplified implementation of the nef new of the new def variant, which creates a new AST inserting uh, new items in the middle as well as assigning the original return value to a new variable, and then uh, return its value after crying, calling pry beforehand. Uh, so um, just to simplify the, the slide, uh, I just left uh, the details of list manipulations inside some kind of private functions uh, that we call here, but conceptually it's, uh, it's what I just uh, described. 
So um, as any macro, it uh, takes some arguments and the, in this case, uh, expressions uh, are put here and the macro returns a new ASD. Uh, there are some caveats uh, to this approach. Uh, in each inserted IEX.pry call, uh, we make the compiler pretend that it's in the same line as the following statement. So that statement is highlighted in IEX. Uh, so every time you uh, go to a next line which has a breakpoint, uh, you see the next line highlighted, um, which allows you to navigate in the code more easily. Uh, this line thing is responsible for that. And uh, you might wonder what is this maybe pry macro? Uh, so it's as if you called ix.pry, but uh, yeah, with a small but. Uh, because with breakpoints between each pair of lines, uh, the continue helper of IEX, uh, which normally just continues and resumes execution, uh, in this case, it takes execution to the next line uh, because there's IEX that prime before that, before that inserted. So uh, we should be able to actually do both, uh, both resume the execution and just navigate to the next line. And uh, a solution that we can uh, do is uh, only call IEX pry via this helper uh, if it's called through a special macro uh, that sets a flag in ETS, uh, kind of a global one. Uh, and for this purpose, we're gonna implement a resume helper to distinguish from the raw continue one. So in this implementation, uh, when the module is mixed in using use, uh, we create a pry macro that sets a flag in ETS uh, that precise pry is running. Uh, so our custom breakpoint statements that run conditionally in the custom pry enabled mode are in fact executed. Uh, so when we uh, execute this macro, we actually insert this flag and set it to true. Uh, and as I said, uh, the next uh, macro works identically as continue. And the resume macro calls continue if uh, the ETS flag is set. And also the maybe prime macro uh, only called privately uh, by this mechanism, looks up the precise pry flag in ETS. And if it's set, so a breakpoint is currently activated, uh, it calls ix.pry. And otherwise, it's just uh, continues the execution. Um, for, uh, yeah, it's uh, conceptually, it's uh, correct but something that we probably would have to uh, do in order to make it work correctly with uh, many processes running at once is to somehow uh, introduce a distinction between which process has it enabled uh, in ETS. But uh, just for simplicity, it's good enough to, uh, to show it to you like this, I guess. And uh, then, as you can see, you can navigate through your code with the next helper. Uh, so it goes through particular lines of code in the module that has the use precise pry directive and currently returns functions values as defined in the code itself. So when you're here, uh, then, as I said, the next line of code after pry is highlighted. Uh, then when you call next, uh, you go to the next one. And as, as you can see, uh, variable values are always correctly calculated. And you can go on and on uh, 
with the next statement here. Um, I can see several obstacles that make this approach require much more thought to be fully practical, which is mostly due to Elixir's own micro-based nature. For instance, as we said, many language features are themselves defined using macros, and we were overriding the def macro itself, which looks like a pretty crazy idea. Uh, so applying the AST modification globally to the application would require replacing the def module macro itself. Uh, we can also imagine a recursive analysis of all functions in a module for the existence of nested anonymous functions and other call blocks, but it still wouldn't help much for the purpose of stepping in and out of a particular line of code, because uh, it would rely on uh, all functions in question being decorated using our macros. Uh, but maybe we might be able to overcome this with uh, the break macro, I guess. Uh, so in general, I believe that while it wasn't the purpose originally, augmenting IEX with the ability to navigate the code would be an awesome addition that would greatly boost developers' productivity. Uh, moreover, there is still an important issue stemming from how micro expansion works itself. If an evaluated code has an origin in a custom macro, uh, then you never get to see it in the stack trace or get there in IEX using Pride. And the kind of place you're in at the time was where uh, macro expansion was started. But then when I realized that even Dev itself uh, is a macro, then uh, I'm wondering if there is a better way to manage it. Mm, I don't know yet. Uh, but it's probably something that I'm going to uh, try thinking about in the future, I guess. Mm. So wrapping up, mm, overall with my presentation more than anything else, I wanted to uh, show how a tinkering attitude and willingness to experiment can help you circumvent the shortcomings of your existing toolset. Uh, Elixir has got good tools that can cover your needs in both the low-level code debugging uh, and monitoring the beam in production, but uh, you can make them even better suited to your needs yourself in just a few minutes. And this is, again, an area where we can use Elixir's uh, metaprogramming capabilities to adjust our tools to your needs, while uh, still remembering that uh, with great power comes great responsibility, and as all Elixir masterminds are going to tell you uh, some kind of overindulgence in macro usage can make code hard to debug, uh, though there's definitely room for improvement in their compiler and related toolset with regard to, let's say, knowing where you are in the code. Uh, so, yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, here are some links that we're also going to share with you later on. Uh, you can uh, have a look at our website where we, uh, from time to time, uh, share something interesting in the Curious and Blog, uh, both on the technical and the business side of things, which I really recommend you to, to visit. Uh, you can find me on Twitter or just ask me anything on the, in my uh, email address. And there is a companion repository for uh, these uh, things I was talking about, which is still empty. And I know I was supposed to actually uh, fill it with code after the latest Elixir Conf, but it's still a work in progress. And I promise to get there uh, in the near future to uh, put something interesting there. Uh, so thank you very much for listening and uh, attending the first Curiosum Elixir meetup. Uh, it's really great to have you uh, on board today. And I guess it's now uh, time to move on to the Q&A. So I'm going to uh, stop my screen sharing now and just switch on the Q&A mode.
Okay. Uh, I guess the candy mode is active. Okay, so the first question from uh, Dario de Filippis is, uh, have you successfully connected a local observer to a remote node you're running inside the Docker container? Uh, any tips? Um, actually, I haven't, but I uh, I know for sure that it's possible. Um, running inside a Docker container would, would probably entail some kind of uh, port forwarding for this purpose. Uh, but um, yeah, that might be an interesting idea for uh, exploring. So maybe in the near future, uh, I could think of exploring this and maybe writing a blog post on this topic. So thanks for this question. Uh, a question from uh, Zoran Boscovich. Uh, Is there any ID that supports debugging online level without changing code in it? Thank you for your question. Uh, this is something that I actually decided not to cover for for the reason of time constraints, but um, there is some support for uh, debugging, uh, you know, plugging in the Erlang debugger into Visual Studio Code uh, in extensions such as Elixir LS. But uh, for some reason, and I still haven't got to the bottom of it, uh, I find it really buggy. Uh, for example, uh, if I use this, I need to disable live uh, recompiling of code in Phoenix framework to make it work because it gives me errors when I do this. Uh, so sometimes it works fine, uh, at other times it doesn't really work fine. That's why I don't really recommend this because I basically want to uh, get to a stage where I have one tool that I can stick to 90% of the time mm, when debugging stuff. And this problem mm, means that I wouldn't really be able to uh, focus on using this tool for uh, more than just a few minutes. Um, yeah, so I guess that's my answer to this. Uh, do you have any experience with, uh, a question from Jakub Borusevich, uh, do you have any experience with using properly property-based testing uh, in uh, Elixir? If so, could you elaborate if it adds a lot of value compared to typical unit testing? Uh, I don't really have any experience in doing this. Uh, I don't really know if there is a specifically Elixir-based tool to do that, though I've seen uh, something like this for Erlang. I think uh, in the resources of the program Pragmatic Bookshelf, there is a book on that. So uh, if I were to... Uh, tell you where to look for information that I would lead you probably there, I guess. Um, a question from Hendrik. Uh, what about VS Code with Elixir? Um, so as I mentioned uh, just a moment ago, uh, debugging tools for um, Elixir in VS Code and, uh, well, its extensions, uh, haven't really worked 100% fine, fine, fine for me uh, so far. So uh, while VS Code and Elixir LS are really a great combination in general um, with, uh, you know, IntelliSense and stuff like that, debugging is still something that uh, doesn't really satisfy me. So I stick to whatever I can do is in the REPL. Uh, another question from Zoran, uh, what is your way of backtracking and do you have some uh, process that 
<coughs> rolls out after a bug is solved? Uh, <clears throat> that's a good question. I think uh, something, uh, well, something that we use on the, in most of the projects we, we have control uh, on is Sentry, uh, which is well integrated with GitHub and allows us to, for example, quickly propagate any issue that arises uh, in the code in the form of, for example, an unhandled exception into a GitHub issue, uh, as well as assign developers to any issue that uh, that pops up. Uh, and, you know, uh, with its release tracking capabilities, uh, it's uh, really, really, it really, really makes uh, our lives easier in terms of, for example, finding which revision might have caused the issue or even what which, which specific lines of code might be the culprit here. Uh, and it's also very good um, in the, uh, well, it's also very easy to integrate different uh, text stacks into that. So you can use the same tool for Elixir for any uh, front-end tools that you have, uh, for which it's also got a nice uh, source map support, uh, breadcrumb collecting for uh, user activity, which led to a specific error. Um, so yeah, it's a tool that we can surely recommend for this purpose. <clears throat> 